Hello, I'm Jen Letchford, Tissue Viability Nurse Advisor with Coloplast. I'd like to thank you for joining me today on the session um, around moist wound healing. Our learning objectives for this session are to be able to describe the differences between moist and dry wound healing, to recognise the implications that dry or moist wound healing will have um, on our wound care practice, and to understand some of the key evidence supporting moist wound healing will also help to dispel some of those myths um, that we may, may come across in our practice. So I'd like to, to just talk to you about the Coloplast three-step approach. And this is an approach to tr really try and help simplify our wound management. It consists of three steps. Step one is to assess the patient and provide that really thorough holistic assessment. Step two is to prepare our wounds and remove any of those barriers to healing. And step three is to treat our wounds um, and select an appropriate treatment choice in order to, to best um, support that patient's outcomes. And we recognise that there's a change in the wound care landscape at the moment. Demographics of patients are changing, our workload and workforce are increasing, we have a reduction in funding and the patient settings in which we're managing these wounds um, is also changing. The impact of chronic wounds is huge. Around 3.8 million uh, wounds are managed annually by the NHS and that's at a cost of £8.3 billion. Pounds. I mentioned that we were seeing a change in where these wounds were being managed and actually we've seen that there's a huge increase in district and community uh, nursing time but also healthcare assistance time in, in managing these wounds. So we're very much seeing these wounds um, being managed in, in primary care settings or community settings. I just want to talk to you here about Betty's story and a suboptimal versus optimal pathway of care. So in the suboptimal pathway of care, Betty was seen at 70 years old and in a health check and she was recognised as being overweight. At 74, Betty went on to graze her ankle um, and she just put a plaster on it. Five weeks later, that hadn't healed and she went and saw her GP. GP gave her antibiotics um, and a couple of weeks after that, it still hadn't progressed towards healing. So she came back and saw the practice nurse. She had various different treatments, um, but a referral to the vascular team was made. She had an antimicrobial treatment on, but again, that didn't help with Betty's wound healing at this point. A further eight weeks on and various treatments later, um, Betty was seen in the hospital setting by the vascular team. Um, but by this point, she was needing community nurses to visit her at home. Um, and that was because she deteriorated so much. So again, community nurses continued to treat Betty um, and se further seven weeks on um, of treatment, she developed a cellulitis. She ended up in hospital for five days or so, um, again requiring intravenous antibiotics at this point and an antimicrobial. After various treatments, various uh, services being involved with her care, Betty did eventually go on to heal, but this was two, two years later, and at a total cost of £5,673. If we now compare that to an optimal pathway of care, at 70 years old, when Betty was initially seen for her health check, um, she was given compression therapy. Um, at 74, when she then grazed her ankle, her leg, um, she went to visit the pharmacist. And as per the lower limb pathway at the time, she was then seen by a practice nurse within a couple of days. She'd had that full assessment and ABPI. After five weeks, the ulcer had then healed and she remained in compression therapy um, with an annual lower limb assessment. So overall, that healing took six weeks at a total cost of £505. So you can see the significant difference here between a suboptimal pathway of care and an optimal pathway of care. When we're thinking about wound healing, um, we need to, to think about wounds heal um, quicker in this moist environment. So exposing a wound to the air so it can breathe is actually a mistake. 
but it's something that we might commonly hear in, in practice, either from patients or from their relatives. We actually know that wounds heal twice as fast in a moist environment compared to a dry environment. And George Winter, back in 1962, um, did this first piece of research into moist wound healing. And that's who found that actually wounds do heal quicker if we um, help to create this, this optimum moist healing environment for them. He found that the regrowth and, and epithelialization um, of superficial or ac acute wounds happens twice as quickly in a moist environment compared to dry. So the epithelial migration in moist, moist wound healing, these epithelial cells need that moist environment to be able to start that migration process across the wound bed. And clinical stu studies do uh, demonstrate that, that these wounds healing in moist conditions um, stimulate growth factors which help those epithelial cells to proliferate and migrate across um, and repair that wound. They need that moisture there in order to, to be able to migrate. Therefore, if the wound is too dry, it will slow that process down. So the history of moist wound healing. I've already mentioned that in 1962, George Winter undertook some early research looking at the speed of, of healing, um, and he did that using pigs and pig skin and, and wounds created on pigs. But it was in the, the, the early 1960s that the wounds were routinely exposed to the air um, to dry them out, um, or they were covered with a dry gauze dressing. Now you can see from what I've already told you that actually this, this is likely to slow down that healing process. So the piece of research that George Winter did was absolutely crucial and, and has helped um, with our development of products and things up, up until today. Um, at the time, Winter's observations were really exciting and he concluded for the first time ever that this environment, this moist wound environment, had a significant impact on the healing trajectory of wounds. So dressings that promote moist wound healing. We need to think about which, uh, what dressing we're selecting in order to help create that optimum healing environment. And we look here at occlusive dressings or semi-occlusive dressings. Um, occlusive dressings produce that impermeable barrier and that isolates the wound from any external environment. They produce the, the hypoxic environment in which the wound bed um, will stimulate and revascularize the wound bed quicker um, to help with healing. Then we have semi-occlusive dressings. They act in the same way, however, uh, the dressing is permeable and allows that gaseous exchange. The dressings transmit that moisture vapour at a lower rate of production um, of moisture by the underlying tissue, creating a, a moist environment for healing. Moisture isn't the only condition that, that we need to think about when we, we look at healing. We also need to think about bio-burden, um, we need to think about oxygen levels, the pH balance of, of the wound, and the temperature of the wound. And it's only when we get these balanced that we then see um, a good healing trajectory for our patient. Moist wound healing isn't suitable for every wound type. And moist dressings it should be used in caution with patients with diabetes, for example. So it could be a, a diabetic foot old ulcer, or it could be somebody who has a gangrenous wound, in which case we need to, to make sure that we're selecting an appropriate um, wound treatment for these patients. We must also give some caution to patients with a degree of arterial disease or arterial compromise. We don't want to make these, these wounds too wet um, and we want to, to try and, and protect these areas. If you're unsure, then you should be referring on to a more specialist service to help support you with these patients. Moist wound healing does not increase the risk of infection. Again, this is something that you might hear quite commonly in your practice. I don't want the wound to be moist because it might increase the risk of infection. Well, that's actually not true. We need a moist environment, as I've already explained, to help those epithelial cells migrate across the wound. Your patients might have some concerns that, 
moist wound healing or, or dressing a wound um, will slow it down. Actually, we need to be able to explain to our patients why we're selecting the dressings that we are selecting in order to help that wound healing environment. Exudate plays a vital part in wound healing and provides nutrients to the wound, um, such as protein, glucose and white blood cells. So we might also see sluffy wounds or come across sluffy wounds in our practice. And actually not all of these sluffy wounds are infected. Bacteria are present in all wounds, um, no matter what the levels of exudate are. Um, but contamination doesn't mean that the wound is, is infected as such and actually doesn't cause any harm at this point. During the inflammatory stage of healing, um, the neutrophils will start to destroy and any invading microorganisms by engulfing them. And actually they can leave behind this residue of non-viable tissue called slough. So although we might want to remove the slough if, if there are high levels of slough in a wound bed and we might want to prepare that wound and remove any devitalised tissues um, to help the, the wound healing environment, um, it's not necessarily an infection that we're seeing. When we look at wet, to dry, wet and dry dressings, wet to dry dressings, there are some disadvantages. Um, typically these would have been like a wet gauze, for example, and we would apply it to the wound and when we go to remove it, that wet gauze has dried out. And actually that can damage the granulation tissue or any epithelial cells that are starting to migrate across. It can also cause pain on removal for our patient and some of those fibres of those dressings could actually be left um, in the wound bed. So wet to dry dressings aren't generally used in practice anymore but you may well still come across them um, if they're being used by a particular service for a particular patient. So other drawbacks with dry dressings, they can have a cooling effect on the wound bed and actually slow down the cellular activity, meaning we have a delayed wound healing or it can increase the, increase the amount of time taken um, to dress the wound, making treatment costs less effective. It may also increase the risk of infection from higher frequency of dressing changes. So dry wound healing, if a scab forms for example, it's nature's way of preventing any water loss or external contaminants. But a scab can form that barrier, um, which actually slows down that, that regeneration of epithelial cells. It creates an environment that's at, that can be detrimental to healing, as the epithelial, epithelial cells have to push away um, the scab and burrow into the wound to be able to migrate anywhere. So again, this, having a scab form on a wound isn't always a positive thing, and this is why we need that moist wound healing to prevent that scab formation. So re research has shown us that moist wound healing also in helps, um, helps with scar formation and scar tissue. And if we look at a study here um, of a sample size of 144 wounds that were created on four pigs, um, containing a, a full thickness, partial thickness, uh, meshed split thickness skin grafts um, and incisional wounds, Actually what this showed was that those wounds that were covered and, and kept moist um, throughout their healing process actually improved that scar tissue outcome at the end of the healing. So another reason why we need to be able to have these discussions with our patients if they are thinking that, that leaving a wound open to the air is beneficial, we need to be able to explain to them that actually not only does moist wound healing help with the healing process, but it also helps with that scar formation. So as I've just mentioned, that moist wound healing significantly reduces the scar formation. You have a decreased inflammatory response um, which results in diminished scarring um, in moist wounds. So the scar surface area was also significantly less in the studies that have been done in comparison um, to those wounds that were treated with dry dressings. Scar tissue uh, strength was about 90% greater in full thickness moist wounds compared with dry wounds. So our learning objectives for today were 
to describe the differences between moist and dry wound healing and to recognise some of the implications associated with both moist and dry wound healing. Hopefully we've, we've been able to cover those for you today and also give you an understanding of some of the key supporting evidence linked to moist wound healing. Thank you for joining me. I hope to see you again soon.